Good morning, church family. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for remembering to change your clocks last night and everything. I went out and did some uh, calls with Brother Wayne yesterday, some visits. And uh, while we were out, I told him, I sure hope I remember to move my clock forward tonight. So I'm here on time since I'm teaching Sunday school. And uh, that would be really embarrassing to show up an hour late as a Sunday school teacher. But uh, I'm, <clears throat> I feel really blessed that so many came this morning and everything. And since they knew I was teaching Sunday school and since we changed our clocks forward and everything. But like I said, thank you for being here. I was uh, just uh, glad to see everybody this morning. Amen. You know, I just, <clears throat> I don't know if I can put this into words, but I, I just, I love this church. And I love being here. And I love the Word of God. I love His Word, you know. And it's just Julie and I have been spending a lot of time. That's one uh, real blessing of being empty nesters like we are. All our kids are grown and gone now. And uh, we've got more time to spend together in the Word of God. And that's our, our morning routine when we get up. We spend probably about 45 minutes or an hour or more in, you know, reading the Word of God and in prayer. And it's, it's just a blessing to be able to do that, to be able to handle His Word and uh, to be able to study it and learn it. But that's what we're here for. We still need to be taught, don't we? We still Amen. need Sunday school. So if you'll open your Bibles up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to continue in our study there, in our journey through this wonderful book, this wonderful letter from Paul to the uh, Corinthian church. I was looking through the, uh, the lesson plan, the lesson book that uh, Brother Jason gave me, and uh, there's a lot of really good information in there, but I kind of struggle with it sometimes because there's so much there, and there's so much in the Word of God, and I, I want to be able to get it all in, and I know that I'm limited on time and everything. I see it's already 15 after 10, so I've got, what, about a half an hour or so to do this, <laughs> so I need to move right along, but I was, you know, look, as, a, as I was looking at this lesson here, lesson nine, I was looking at the title of it, Getting the Most Out of Life, and you know, that almost kind of sounded to me like something that you would hear out in the world, and I kind of changed the title to better suit it, or better suit me anyway, uh, to uh, getting the most out of your Christian life, okay, and I know that that's the whole idea of this lesson, okay, but you know, we need to think about that, how to get the most of it out of our Christian life. Uh, in, the, in the book, it, it uh, quotes a verse there. Uh, well, actually, it's your first, your first question right there. According to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, what are the three parts that make up a human being? I'm going to read that verse to you right here. But it says, and, they, and the very God of peace sanctif sanctify you wholly, and pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is it that makes, up, makes us up? According to this verse, we're spirit, soul, and body. You know... Have you ever thought about what it means when we read in the Bible that we're made in the image of God? You know, God is a trinity. And it's said that we're a trichotomy. That's how we're made in, in God's image. But there's just something unique about us and his creation. You know, you don't, humans are not animals. As much as they like to behave like animals today and as much as they like to, to act like animals and think like animals or, or think they are animals, and therefore unaccountable for, for their actions, they're not. They're made in the image of the living God. Therefore, they're accountable to God. You know, I just wanted to, I just wanted to throw that in there. In the book, it talks, about, uh, it talks about threes a lot, okay? And I was thinking about, in light of how to get the most out of your Christian life, how to make the most count for eternity. And, you know, I think about, when I say that, I think about time, past, present, and future. You can't do anything about the past, you're living in the present right now, but actually you're always constantly moving towards the future, okay? Uh, I think of the old cliche or the old, the old phrase or whatever that uh, only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ shall last. Amen. And there's, there's great, great truth in that. And I think as we look at this lesson this morning, we need to kind of keep that in our minds. But if you look at, uh, look at our, our uh, verses here and... Uh, 2 Corinthians, as we, as we finish out this fourth chapter, I'm going to read the first two verses to you here. We have the same spirit of faith according as it is written. 
I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Paul there is quoting from the 116th Psalm, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. And then that 14th verse, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. I want you to think for just a minute about those, those verses, particularly that 13th verse and that psalm that he quoted, and think about the era or the time when, this, when Paul penned this, okay? Uh, it was a very desperate time. We, we look at ourselves today as being in a very desperate time, and Brother Wayne's always saying this when he's preaching, you know, it's bad, but we're not having to deal with the things that Christians had to deal with back then in the early church. We're not. It's bad, and it's getting worse. We, we know that. But praise God, I mean, we are still free to come here and worship him. Amen. You know, we're, and, and we don't have to worry about the police or the military busting in here and busting up this meeting and arresting everybody and, and carting us all off, okay? We still are free to do that. That was a different time that he wrote this in, and it, I think it, because it was a different time, it, it meant more. But we, we need to think about us today. If you believe, do you speak? Do you talk about your faith? Do you talk about it? Do, do other people know that you're saved? You know, and when I say this, you know, this, this lesson here brought me under conviction because I don't always speak about my Lord like I should, okay? I don't have a problem talking about other things, but why is it that when we want to talk to somebody about Jesus, we get nervous? I can talk all day to somebody about hiking the Appalachian Trail. I, you know, I've, I've been doing that, and I, I love to hike. That's something I enjoy, and that's something I can talk about. I guess because it's a, it's a secular subject or whatever. It's not, it's not something that's going to hurt somebody's feelings probably or whatever. But when it, when it comes to the gospel, we kind of hold back. We kind of restrict ourselves. You know, I, I wanted to read a, another portion of Scripture to you, and I'm going to ask for some volunteers here in a minute. I like that when we all participate and uh, everybody takes turns reading Scripture here and everything that we're going to be looking at. So if you'll kind of... Watch those scriptures that are in your, uh, in your notes there, and I'll have, you, I'll have somebody, I'll call on somebody to read here when I ask for volunteer, but I'm going to read something that's not in there, and Genesis chapter 1 has to do with this, what we were just looking at, or what I was just talking about, but uh, in Genesis chapter 1, talking about being created in God's image, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't pass this up when I was thinking about uh, what I was just saying and everything that I thought we really need to look at this verse too or these verses 26 and 27 in, in, 20, in uh, Genesis 1. And God said, let us make man in our image af after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over, every, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And this is the important part for today, of course. Male and female created he them. You know, we need to keep that, we need to keep saying that over and over and keep Amen. repeating these verses in our mind because we're living in, we're living in a desperate time in that all of these simple truths, simple evident truths are, are just being ignored or, or try, that people are trying to change them today. Our society is trying to change them and we can't allow that to happen. But you know, just that, when I thought about that too, I also thought about how God makes us distinct from his, the rest of his creation. And part of that distinction is he gives man dominion over the rest of his creation. Isn't that amazing? You ever think about that, how God does that, how God uses man in, in that way? But, you know, that just, it, to me, it, it all ties into this idea of the Christian life and what we're supposed to be like as Christians, how we're supposed to have dominion. We're not supposed to be the ones that back down. We're supposed to be the ones that are on the offensive. We're supposed to be the ones that are going out there. And I'm not talking about being offensive just to offend people or to be uh, contentious for the sake of co contention. But the Bible does say that we should earnestly contend for the gospel, doesn't it? You know, we need to do that. But under uh, your first point there in your, in your uh, outline, uh, the first one there, and I like how they do this in this, in this study, uh, everything has to begin with the same letter, I guess, or whatever, be emphatic. Uh, be emphatic. When I first started to look at this, I didn't even know what that word meant. <laughs> I had to look it up in the dictionary. I kind of had maybe a vague idea, but we get our word emphasis from that, okay? And, and the reason why they put this in here was because of, of another word that we are all familiar with, and that's boldness. Boldness. Amen. You know, I like to think of, think of it as holy boldness. 
The Apostle Paul was bold. I think we need, to, we need to be bold as Christians, you know. And again, talking about the world, and whenever I think about the Word of God, whenever I study the Word of God, I always think about how it stands against what the world stands for, okay? You notice that society today, they don't have any trouble being bold. They don't have any trouble being bold, particularly when you think about perverseness. You know, we have so much perversion out there today, and look at how bold the perversion is in your face all over the place today, everywhere. You know, we need to be bold. We need to be more bold, if you will, okay? But the, they certainly don't have any trouble with that, so we certainly shouldn't either. But uh, if I could get somebody to read 1 Corinthians 9.16 for us. Somebody? Brother Darrell? For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Did you hear that? <laughs> he said, that's the Apostle Paul writing that, okay? He's saying that he had to preach the gospel. He didn't have any other choice. I think about Brother Wayne, okay? Brother Wayne, what would you do if you didn't preach the gospel? <laughs> what would you do? I mean, I don't expect you to answer that right now out loud or anything, but just food for thought. I mean, I look at this man, and he's up here every Sunday preaching, and I know how much he loves to preach. I've known many preachers in my life that were like that, that they just, they lived to preach. That was all they could do. I remember a preacher that I knew years ago that he was just so distraught over problems in the church and, and complaints and everything, he just wanted to quit. He just wanted to quit. I remember talking to him, and I asked him that question. I said, what would you do? He said, well, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to come back next Sunday, and I'm going to preach again. That's what I'm going to do. Because <laughs> he, he knew that that was God's call on his life, and he knew that he had to do that. That's what Paul is saying here. You know, he, he talks about it. He talks about it being, uh, what's the word he uses there? A necessity. A necessity. It's a need. It's a need. He has a need to do that. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us as Christians had that same need? Had that same necessity? And I know that we can't all preach. We can't all stand in the pulpit and preach. I'm not a preacher. But I still need to share the gospel. I still need to tell people about my Lord. But he, uh, you know, I was thinking of another verse, and I'm going to turn there. You, you can if you want to, but uh, you don't need to. In, in the Old Testament, I like, I like how the Old Testament, you can't really understand or, or get the full effect of the Old Testament without looking to the New Testament. And likewise, you can't get the full effect with the New Test, in the New Testament without looking to the Old. So in Jeremiah chapter 20, I think of a verse there, and I think this was just quoted here in church not too long ago, but in chapter 20 of the uh, of, uh, book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's prophecy, I'm going to read verse 8 and 9 to you there. This is, I've always loved this, these two verses right here. He says, For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, a derision daily. Do you understand what he's saying there? <clears throat> he became a joke to his people, a mockery. They mocked him, you know, and, and if, you, if you preach the gospel, if you, if you talk to people about the Lord, you're going to have people that are going to make fun out of you. I've had it happen to me, and I'm sure a lot of you have had it happen to you too. That's what he's talking about, about a derision. He, he was fed up. He had it. He was at his wit's end here. That's what he's saying. He said, I'm tired of doing this because I don't see any result, and people just make fun out of me. And I'm become a laughing stock and everything. But then look at verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. That's how, that's how bad it became for him. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. In other words, he couldn't keep, keep it back. He couldn't hold it in. He had to speak. You know, it's, it's just exactly almost word for word what Paul was saying. There was a necessity laid upon Jeremiah. He couldn't hold back. He had to prophesy. God gave him a, prof a prophecy, and he had, to, he had to speak it. He couldn't stop. In uh, the point number three there, <clears throat> what does Peter write about the word of God in 1 Peter 1.25? I'd like to have somebody read that for us, but I'd, Brother Jeremy, I'd like to have you read 24 and 25, if you don't mind. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. 
Do you get that? Talking about um, the time that we have on this earth, the time that we have to serve God, the time that we have to make a difference. It's so brief. It's so brief. Elsewhere in Scripture, it's, our, our lives are, are, you know, they're actually likened to a vapor, a vapor that, that appears for a short time. I, silly illustration, but you see a lot of people today vaping in their car, and you see that vapor blow out of the window, and it's gone almost as soon as it hits the air. It's gone. I think about that. I, I think the Bible had something else in mind here, but, but uh, <laughs> the, the vapor, you know, that appears for a short time, and then it's gone, you know, but, uh, but the point is not how long we have, but the, import, the, the important point here is the Word of God, the Word of God. That it needs to be gotten out, okay? Because it's going to last forever. We're going to pass. But people are going to remember us for something. You know, and I've heard Brother Wayne say this before in preaching, you know, but what, what are they going to remember you for? What are they going to remember me for? I, something that concerns me a lot is what are my children going to remember me for? I think about that, you know. What are my kids going to think of dad after he's gone? Yeah, dad was this way or he was that way. Are they going to think about dad as just being, you know, all he ever did was worry about stuff or dad did this or dad hiked a lot. He did this all the time or whatever. Or are they going to think of me as dad loved the Lord, dad loved God's word? I hope so. I hope so. But the word of God, it's, it's always fresh. It's always new. Can I get somebody to read Psalm 23, the fourth verse? Brother Pete. Julie and I have been spending some time in, in uh, that 23rd Psalm, and that 23rd Psalm is amazing to me. Every time I read it, it it's like it, it's, uh, I get something new from it, almost every time I read it anyway. You know? uh, I did the devotion here a while back at the men's prayer breakfast, and I did it on that, that 23rd Psalm, because there were some things in there that I've been looking at, and, and I, just, I just felt like the Lord was really speaking to me about it, and some of those things are are what we're going to look at right here, but in this, in this one verse in particular, this fourth verse. You notice the language there, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The psalmist, David here, you notice he doesn't say, though, yea, though I walk through the valley of death. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You think about what a shadow is. In the lesson book, it talks about how you can't be hurt by a shadow. You know, a car may pass by you really close and the shadow passes over you, but the shadow's not going to hurt you. The car would, but the shadow isn't. You know, it uses that as kind of an illustration. I think about what makes the shadow. It's the light that makes the shadow. You know, we look to the light. We look to the light of the Word of God. That's where we look. That's where, you know, that's where we get our, that's where we get our comfort. That's where, it, where we get, uh, you know, our sure, our sure footing or however you want to say it, you know. We don't look at the shadow. We don't pay attention to the shadow. And, and another thing, I pay attention a lot to semantics, to words, when I study the Word of God. But when it says that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're passing through. You're passing through. And that goes back to that thought about our lives being a vapor. You know, there's a time coming for all of us when we're gone from this, from this earth and with the Lord in glory. And you're going to look back on this time and it's going to seem like, wow, that was just a brief breath, a brief moment, you know, in eternity. And, you know, as you compare it to eternity, it's, it's nothing. But um, keep looking up to the light. But uh, back in our, in our scripture there in uh, 2 Corinthians, I want to read a couple more verses here. Take these two verses at a time. That's the way the, the uh, lesson plan is laid out. I think that's a good way. But uh, you look at the next two verses here, 16 and 17. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I don't read the 15th verse. I meant to do that first. <laughs> for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. Now the 16th. Let's do this in order here. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I think I went straight to that 16th verse because that's the one I really wanted to emphasize here this morning. But I was thinking about, I was thinking about this. And, you know, one of the things about getting old 
is you think more, or you should, particularly as a Christian, about the end of your life than you think about where you're at right now. I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 62 now. I turned 63 later this year, but um, I feel pretty good. I mean, I feel pretty healthy and everything, but I know that I'm fading, okay? I know that I don't feel, and I certainly know when I look at myself in the mirror that I don't look like I did when I was in my 20s or 30s, okay? But the idea is that, you know, we're, the outward man is perishing. It's passing from the scene. But the inward man, for us as Christians, or the inward woman, needs to be renewed day by day. We need to be strengthened day by day. We need to, we need to draw closer to the Lord day by day. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, I don't want to say it's easier when we're older, but it just seems like it should be more natural when we're older because we realize that, you know what, I'm passing. I'm passing from the scene. Soon my life's going to be over. It's going to be past, you know. But uh, when I was looking at this verse, I really, I really thought about somebody that made a profound impression on me here in this church recently, Brother Dan Reed, when he was here preaching. I remember the first time I met him when I saw him, I came over and I shook his hand, introduced myself and everything. He was sitting up here in about the third or fourth row on the, on the right over here. And I remember looking at him, and I remember when he walked up to the, the platform up here, and I just, I just thought, uh, I hope I don't offend you, Brother Wayne, when I say this, but I just looked at him and I said, is this guy even going to be able to finish a message? He just looked so frail to me. Wow. You know, and so weak. But when he got up there, I just saw God working in him. Amen. Okay. I mean, God gave him the strength, the physical strength, the power to get up here and preach the word of God. And that voice that just bellowed out from him when he preached the word of God, I just, I was amazed. I mean, I was looking at him thinking, is that coming from him? But I mean, that just shows you what God can do with a man who's yielded to him. You know, and he just, he made such an impression on me, Amen. you know, just, I, I love that guy. And I just loved listening to him <laughs> preach. He was, he was just such a blessing. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, another verse in the Old Testament. Uh, in uh, Dan, in the book of Daniel, Daniel uh, chapter 12 and verse 3. I said Dan because it's abbreviated here in my notes, <laughs> in your notes. <laughs> I don't think we ought to call the prophets by their shortened names or whatever, but uh, book of Daniel, chapter 12, if it helps any, it's right next to the book of Hosea. <laughs> I love these Old Testament prophets. Can I get a volunteer to read that third verse there in Daniel? Brother Pete, Peter there? You would. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn men into righteousness as the stars forever and ever. <laughs> I like that verse. And again, like I said before, you know, there's always there's always a parallel in the New Testament, you know. I think about, well, throughout the scriptures, actually, this one is also actually Old Testament, but I think about Proverbs chapter. 11, verse 30, where it says that he that winneth souls is wise. There's wisdom in sharing the gospel. There's wisdom in, in telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here in the book of Daniel when he talks about turning many to righteousness, as a, as shining as the, stars of, uh, as the stars forever and ever. Um, you know, I think about, as I look at this, you can't have positive things like this without thinking about the negative sometimes, too. But I think about the negative. You know, when you think of somebody being a star today, what do you think about? I think you know where I'm going. I mean, most people, don't we think about movie stars? Don't we think about rock stars? I mean, that's even been said of a president. I remember when President Obama was president. Somebody made a reference to him as being the rock star president. You know, but uh, we think about these that are referred to as stars today, and it's always amazed me the number of people that acknowledge them or that follow them or take them seriously as if they have some answers for us in life. I mean, how tragic is that, you know, that people will do that? Certainly we as Christians should never do that, but, you know, that's Satan's, that's Satan's counterfeit. That's Satan's counterfeit. He wants to take from us the very best and give us that, 
<laughs> which is nothing, okay? But uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't go to that source for, for inspiration or for, for comfort or for motivation or for anything. But uh, in your, back in your notes here, in uh, the sixth point that we have right here, according to Colossians 3.10, how is our spirit renewed? Somebody to read Colossians 3.10? Brother Andrew? And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So what's that verse telling us? In the knowledge after the image of him that created him. It, it goes back to this idea of whose image are we made in? We're made in the image of the living God, but um, I want to bring out another thought or elaborate on that a little bit, okay? We are to be conformed to somebody's image, okay? We are to be conformed to somebody's image. You know, I'm a firm believer in the fact that everybody takes on an image, okay? Everybody follows somebody. Everybody worships something. I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people that say they don't worship or they don't believe in worship, say they don't believe in God, but if you watch that person close enough, they have a God in their life. They have something or someone that they worship. Uh, I've known guys. I had a, a best friend when I was in high school. And I remember his, uh, we got into a conversation one time at his house with his mom. And his mom went to church, but he didn't. And his mom was talking about God. And she said, I just think that you need to believe in something, you know, bigger than yourself or whatever. And he said, well, that's fine, but I think you need to just believe in yourself first. You know, and, and that kind of goes hand in hand with our society, what a lot of people think today. That's why you got these self-help books and, and everything out there, because uh, that's a, that is a form of worship, self-worship. Okay, We are our own God. We can make our minds up. We can decide for ourselves. And certainly you can see that today with everything that's going on in our society today. We've got so much of that. It's, it's sickening. It's sickening. Everybody is their own God. You know, I can decide what's right for me. What's right for you may be right for you, but there's something else that's right for me. You know, that's why, like we hear so much of today, we've got women that want to be men and men that want to be women. We've got people that are just, that shake their fist in, in the face of Almighty God. They, they want to do what they want to do. They want to ignore God. But we're, we're to be conformed to someone. We're to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches us. You know, that's what the word or what the name Christian implies. Little Christ. You know, it's been said before that that was actually brought about as a derogatory term in mocking of Christians. You know, here goes these, these little Jesuses, these little Christs, okay? But uh, we use that today, and I, I love the fact that we use that today. Something that started out as a, as a, a slam. It's actually a blessing. I mean, that's exactly what we're supposed to be. We shouldn't, we shouldn't you know, we shouldn't want to be any other way. But, uh, you know, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you read that, uh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new, cre uh, he's a new creature. You're, you're supposed to be a new creature in Christ. And it says, it goes on to say there, that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, I never could understand this mindset or this philosophy in, in Christianity, which I, I question some of this, if, if it even really is Christianity, where we can get saved and we just go continue right on. It's like, you know, you get saved, there's this little bump, that's your salvation experience, and then you just keep right on going in a straight line. You just keep on behaving yourself and doing this, everything the way you were doing it before. I don't understand that. If you're a new creation, shouldn't your life have changed? Shouldn't it be different? Shouldn't things be new in your life? And I think that that's what that verse is, is telling us there. I need to move along here because I know I'm, I'm kind of running shy on time here, but uh, I get to rambling sometimes a little bit. That's what my wife tells me. So. <laughs> but point number three there, uh, point number two was be evangelistic. We have be emphatic, be evangelistic. And then for the third point, we have to be eternity-minded, eternity-minded. I talked about that a little bit already. But in those verses there, the last two verses in that, in that chapter of, of uh, 2 Corinthians 4 there, we read this. For our light affliction is for but a moment, worketh for, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are, are not seen are eternal. I like that. In fact, I love that. When you think about that, uh, 
again, about our life, you know, that it's, it's as a vapor and it's passing away. Our life is passing away. But the things of God are eternal, okay? Uh, this life is, this life is, is temporal. It's for, it's, for, it's for a short span. But um, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about, Something that I heard Brother Jason say one time, he was talking about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I was going to mention this a little bit later, but this just made me think of it right now, uh, about um, things, that are, things that are perishable. I think that was the term, term that he used, perishable things in our life. Things that are perishing, things that are passing away, things that get old, things that we're going to throw out eventually, things that just don't matter, things that we cling to so much sometimes, and things that we want to hold on to so much. But uh, in uh, point number seven there, I'm going to have somebody read here in just a moment, but uh, what promise does the Lord give us in Matthew 11:30? If somebody would read that, 11, uh, chapter 11 there in, in the back, uh, Brother Rock, if you would read actually 28 through 30 there in Matthew 11. I think that's something that we're in desperate need of today. That's why I wanted him to read that 28th and, and 29th verse. But rest, rest. It seems like we got more time on our hands today to rest, but we do much less resting. I mean, real, really resting. We're, we're a people that's preoccupied. You know, and, and this technology age that we live in and everything. I, I got a real problem with a lot of this technology, but it just seems to me like our lives are way more complicated than they need to be. But, you know, the Lord talks about there, I didn't want to spend too much time on that point, but I, I wanted to say something about this idea in verse 29 of take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. And then he talks about his yoke in the 30th verse being easy and his burden is light. You know, and I think about a yoke, and that's something that we need in life. And uh, I'm going to get real romantic here on you for just a minute, but marriage is a yoke, okay? Marriage is a yoke. <laughs> I told my wife, I was talking to my wife about that the other day, and she kind of laughed at me. But uh, my youngest son, Josh, uh, I've been praying for him for a while that God would put a yoke on him. And what I was actually praying for was that God would give him a wife. Because uh, I was talking to Brother Wayne about this, but it's not... It's not good, the Bible says, way back in Genesis again, that it's not good for a man to be alone. But it's, I, I just want to say it like this, it's particularly not good today for a young man to be alone, okay? He needs to have a wife, okay? He needs to have a wife. He needs to have somebody that he's accountable to. When I say yoke, that's what I mean. And I was joking about the romance thing. I know that doesn't sound romantic, okay? When you think about a yoke, what do you think? You think about two oxen pulling together. But that's really the idea. A marriage is work. It's work. I know, you know, Chris and Tiffany probably don't want to hear that right now, but it's true, okay? It's, it's work. And, and, you know, you, you make it work, and you work at it. You know, Brother Jeremy was saying that last week about he's not going to give up. I like that. You know, we can't give up. We can't give up. We have to keep working. We have to keep striving together. We, we, need, to, we need to bear that yoke together. Okay, and you know, when you get two sinners together, there's going to be problems, right? There's going to be issues that come up. But uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I just thought about that, what the Lord Jesus was saying right there. It speaks of, of that yoke or of uh, uh, following or yoking together. Uh, that eighth, eighth point right there, Hebrews 11, yeah, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Can I get somebody to read that real quick? And we'll, we'll finish up here in just a few minutes, I promise. But if somebody would read that for us. Go ahead, sister. Now faith is the substance of things not or excuse me. Now substance is I'm sorry. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, I like to I like to pick apart apart verses and I, I know I don't have time to do that for very, very long right here, but, uh, you know, this, this, I can't pass this up, okay, it talks about faith being substance. What does substance tell you? What is substance? It's something you can touch and feel. It's something you can see, okay, and that word is put there deliberately because we think of faith as something kind of ambiguous or something that's just out there. We don't really, you can't see faith, 
okay? You can't see it. You can see what faith does. And that's what I think this is talking about. In other words, faith is just as real as anything that you can touch and feel, okay? There needs to be substance to our faith. There needs to be something about our faith. In other words, it needs to be evident. I think I mentioned that before, but uh, it needs to be evident. You know, uh, do we witness? That's work. People need to see that we're working for the Lord. People need to see that our faith is real. There's something to our faith. It's not that we just get up on Sunday morning and go to church or that we read the Bible when nobody else is seeing us at home, but they need to see that when we're out in public, when we're at work, when we're, you know, when we're with our friends or whatever the situation might be. Is it clear? Is it obvious? You know, uh, again, back to verse 13 there in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, where he says, believe, he talks about believing and speaking. If you believe, then you're going to speak about it. If you, if you really believe, uh, somebody described it like this one time, believing in something is not like believing on something, okay? Uh, you can talk to people and they believe in Jesus or they believe in God, but what does that mean? Do they believe on Jesus? Are they putting their trust in him and on him, that they believe on his finished work. That's, you know, that's the important Amen. point. But uh, uh, number nine there in your, in your notes, being eternity-minded requires obeying what command in Colossians 3, 2? Somebody want to read that? Anybody? Stephanie? How critical and how important that is. You know, there's an old cliche or whatever that talks about being heavenly minded. You know, they say, well, that guy is so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. And I know what they're saying when they say that. But the reality of it is we need to be heavenly minded in the right sense, okay? We need to be thinking about eternity like I was saying before. We need, and this kind of, this kind of brings up this idea again of perishables. You know, why do we want to tie our things or tie ourselves to things rather that are perishable or things that are passing from the scene because we know that this life is going to be passed. And eternity, sounds kind of simple to say it this way, but eternity is a whole lot longer than this life, okay? And you're going to live for eternity somewhere. Hopefully that's in, in heaven with the Lord, okay, in glory. But you're going to live there for eternity and you're going to be thinking about what you did in this life. For Christ, are you going to have crowns to cast before Him to cast at His feet? You know. So again, just to reiterate right here before we close, but uh, getting the most out of the Christian life, you know, be emphatic or bold, be evangelistic, and certainly we need to be eternity-minded. Thank you. I mean, appreciate that uh, lesson from uh, God's Word this morning. That wonderful passage, in wonderful passage. Uh, what's the point of this chapter? Let me ask you that real quick. Look at look at your Bible real, real quick before you close it. Look at Second Corinthians chapter four. What's the point of this chapter? Look at verse one. It says, "Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy." Notice what it says. It says, "We faint not." The point of this chapter is not to quit. It's not, not quitting. Have, have any of you felt like quitting at times this year? I mean, does this year just sort of put you in that spot? You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm done. <laughs> I don't know if it's, you know, some of you mothers, maybe you're just done. You know, some of you at work, maybe you're just, I'm tired of this. You, you're working in the ministry, like, I can't handle this anymore. I'm done. You know, I'm fainting. I'm done. But the whole point of this chapter is we faint not. We faint not. Why, why should we not faint? Look at that. I think it's the third verse. For gospel be hid is hid them the lost. Hey, there's some lost people that are dependent on you not to quit. Think about that. You've been praying for them. You want them to get saved. You've been waiting on them to get saved. And if you quit, what is it going to do? There's some, there's some children in ministries that are looking up to you that are lost, that need to be saved, that would get saved, the gospel shine to them. And if you quit, what's going to happen? So what, what is it? It says we faint not. And then it goes on to talk about how we do have these earthen vessels and sometimes we feel like it. I mean, just honestly, we feel like it. But it says that, uh, that our inward man, although, although we feel awful and, and, and we feel like quitting because we're, we're tired and we're wore out, we can be renewed inside. Isn't that a wonderful thought that as a Christian you can be renewed inside? So don't quit because of that. And then notice this last little verse 17. It says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, Working, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Think about that. There's, there's glory to come. 
It might be rough right now. It, it, it's a light affliction in light of that. It's a light affliction, so don't faint. Don't quit. Uh, that's, that's the encouragement that the Apostle Paul has given to us uh, through this chapter is don't faint. Don't quit. So I hope that that's been an encouragement to you. I love this chapter. Wonderful chapter. Uh, I've enjoyed this study. Thank you, Brother Mark, for that. That was a blessing. Dear Heavenly Father God, we love you. Uh, we thank you for this good lesson. Lord, help us with this. Lord, we've all uh, grown weary at times, but Lord, help us not to faint. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.